my name is Lucius Conway. I'm a certified addiction recovery coach and manager of Recovery Coaching Service of New York, LLC. What we do is provide services to individuals as well as to agencies. For individuals, we provide recovery capital building, access to community resources, and more importantly, we provide recovery wellness plan development, implementation, and maintenance assistance and guidance. This translates for agencies into increased client retention, access, quality, outcomes, and efficiency. We do it because we know that one size doesn't fit all. It began with me in my own uh, recovery in a treatment program where I knew when I left that treatment program, I was not going to be relying on a group of people or even another individual other than myself. So I created my own self-directed wellness recovery plan, put it in a book. That book became this business, and now what I do is help others find their way. So I'm not just uh, the manager of Recovery Coaching Service of New York. I'm also its first client. Hi, hello, one and all. Welcome. This is Shira Goldberg, the host of The Addiction Show. I have with me Lucius Conway. He is a really remarkable person, but aren't all my guests? I mean, why else would I have them on if I didn't think that? Uh, he's a CRPA in New York. Um, the reason why I was able to um, um, get so much interest in him is because he has uh, created something for recovery coaches nationwide um, so he's uh, been gracious enough to um, do an entire series with me so these shows with Lucius are going to be talking about certain issues that recovery coaches are are facing um, some of the topics are going to be um, what to expect in a recovery coach or um, how are we getting reimbursed and when is that going to be an opportunity so he's going to he's going to tell us all about that and so much more I just want to say Lucius thank you so much for being on the addiction show and doing our first series ever well thank you for inviting me sure it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here with you today an honor oh thank you so much thank you so much <laughs> so I really, um, I really got excited when I found um, from someone that I uh, value very much. I saw that she put a link up uh, of an article about you, and it blew my mind. So you are a recovery coach in New York State, but New York State is doing something that I really think um, is going to expand throughout the country. So this is really important information for recovery coaches. Um, or for people that are interested in recovery coaching, but more importantly, for um, people to figure out how to pay us. So that's what the show is going to be, and it's um, exciting to have that as a first topic. And you are the one who created this option for us. Well, absolutely. Uh, what what uh, the people at United Health Group, also known as Optum Health, who signed a contract, we actually executed the contract on December 11th of 2014, whereby uh, we became the first unlicensed network provider uh, able to bill Medicaid for peer support services in New York State. And... Uh, she said, well, you're a pioneer in the field. There's nobody else out here doing this uh, at this point. And I said, well, I'm a pioneer or a guinea pig, depending on how you look at it. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's all on you if it works or not. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. No pressure. Yeah, right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So what you're talking about is um, in – we talked about this at quite some length because we're both very passionate about it. Now, um, what our roles as recovery coaches are in all of the wonderful things that we do, but there's a lot of, I think, confusion um, or just lack of awareness. What is a recovery coach and how, how can they help me? How can I work with them in a treatment center? What's, the, you know, what's their place on the continuum of... Uh, of care within a treatment center or a hospital so and how do 
these entities cover our tab and so it's like how are they going to be able to pay us and you figured you figured that out and the pilot is happening right now in New York State right that's correct what what ultimately as you you've indicated the question is uh, how do we fit in the construct of traditional uh, or uh, what we know of as historical uh, treatment for addiction disorders and uh, what the best practices is, has proven is that peer assisting peer, someone who's been through there, uh, the darkness and come out on the other side of the light has been more effective in helping people maintain recovery than our traditional system of drug counselors uh, who may not have had that experience and who are also bound by certain legal boundaries where uh, they're not allowed to interact on a peer-to-peer -peer type basis. Example, they're not allowed to disclose if they've had any addictive disorder in their history. Whereas our uh, recovery coaches are required to disclose. That's a part of our expertise, the fact that we've been there and we can relate to, to having had uh, a bout with an ad addictive disorder and having come through on the other side. Translating that experience into uh, assistive forms to help people find their pathway. The unique thing about recovery coaching is it does not endorse or support any one pathway. A pathway is different for, for, for each individual. Some people are 12 steppers, some people are not. Some people work best in groups, some people are best as, as a loner. And our objective is, as recovery coaches is to try to assist them find their pathway to their best life. Well, one of the things that uh is I think a problem or we're, we're still just trying to uh, figure this out on a collective level but there's so many it's I call it the wild west of recovery coaching because there's so many different ways to be certified there's a lot of uh, options available for people to become a recovery coach you know send me two thousand dollars and I will make that happen for you and send you a PDF file that you can print out on your printer and boom, you know, put your shingle up. So there's a lot of, I think there's still a lot of holes in, in really understanding the, the true benefits of coaching. So that's why I wanted to do the series with you because you are like one of the most renowned people that I know that really have such a well-versed understanding of coaching. Um, so you came, you came from, um, the, well, tell us tell us your background about how you became a coach. But I want to I want to help people understand that um, they're not all equal as far as the certifications, and you don't have to pay these exorbitant prices. Um, I've seen it up to fifteen thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, that's because there's there's not a, enough um, structure. I think so. Tell us about your background and and what you think about what I think. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I uh, I was born and bred in a little place called River Rouge, Michigan, a suburb of southwest Detroit. Uh, I've had an addictive disorder or bouts with addictive disorder most of my life, um, beginning at age as early as at age seven. Uh, if you count sugar, it goes back further than that, which I'm dealing with uh, my addiction to refined sugars now. <laughs> <laughs> but but and, and that's all a part of the the, the wellness uh, plan and, and, and my recovery uh, and what that means to me. So uh, the, the short answer is uh, I was addicted to uh, alcohol first and that graduated to uh, cigarettes and and marijuana and powder cocaine and crack cocaine and and in whatever pills. I mean, it just I, I got to be what they call a garbage head and and. Uh, of course, uh, the life attendant to that uh, followed, uh, including crime and, and all of that. And at one point, this is this was me. This was who I looked like. And when I go and and, and uh, talk to people about it and show them this picture, they say, "Who is that? Who is that?" And, and I said, "That was the guy I was. That's the guy I was." And they were like, "Really?" And I'm like, "Yeah." But um, I didn't know how to deal with uh, primarily uh, emotion. Uh, my disposition, emotional disposition, and being able to control uh, things that happened in my life was, was very, very uh, challenging for me. And I would often default to some type of a substance to make me feel better or make me not feel at all. And that was the objective of it. And uh, through, the, through the years, many, many years, 
that was my routine, and I was functional uh, for the most part. I did some law school, 25 years as a paralegal. Uh, I worked in the entertainment industry. I mean, so I was I was I was rather functional up until a point in my in my early 40s, mid mid to to, to late 40s actually. I got. It, the revelation hit me that I'm not getting younger and I don't want to die on the street like this. Um, and I attempted suicide. And there was a couple of doctors, uh, very, very nice medical doctors, uh, one Eastern Indian and one uh, Latina. And they swore to me, you can have a better life. You can have a better life uh, going to rehab, which is something I never thought about. I never considered that I, I actually had any addictive disorders. I really didn't. And... Uh, and so because of their concern for me, I did. And in the process of doing that, I learned about addictive disorders and I learned how they had been being treated <clears throat> in the current modalities. And one of those current modalities was utilizing recovery coaching. And in the process of uh, going through rehab, I wrote a couple of books, uh, ritual books, because I knew I'm not a group type of person. I'm more of a loner individual. And I knew that in order to maintain my um, recovery and wellness as opposed to sobriety. I wasn't interested so much in being sober as I was in being well, being whole and living a happy life. I know too many sober people who are miserable and that's not what I'm looking for and that wasn't what I was looking for. So in the process of doing that, I was introduced to recovery coaching and I did some investigation and I found the best curriculum was uh, CCAR's curriculum. Uh, that was one that was uh, acknowledged nationwide. Uh, it's one that was adopted by New York State uh, as a criteria, a core educational criteria for applying for the Medicaid reimbursable certified recovery peer advocate position, which is what we're talking about today, how recovery coaches can get in the continuum and get paid. So for those that don't know, what is CCAR and what, tell us a little bit about that training. And so in order to get, because you just said in order to get reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid, that they're basing that on the curriculum of CCAR? That's correct. In Connecticut, uh, it's, it's Connecticut Community, I think for addiction recovery or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I'll, just I, Google it, people. <laughs> just, just Google CCAR addiction and it'll come up. Yeah. Um, or Phil Valentine and it'll come up. Right. Um, the, the, the thing is, Connecticut had developed this curriculum of training individuals who have been, uh, who have had substance use disorder to, to help others with substance use disorder find a pathway to wellness. It was, um, it's a curriculum that Connecticut acknowledged and said, we'll use this core educational component to determine if someone may qualify to be able to serve in a state certified capacity as a uh, recovery, the quote unquote recovery coach, i.e. peer advocate, the, which is a, a term that, that's used in the mental health arena as well. So they also use that peer advocate term. They include that, but it's a recovery coach with additional skill, uh, with an additional set of skills. So Medicaid uh, reimbursement is based on a recovery coach not only having that in New York State and in Connecticut, which is also significant that with the state testing and passing and state certification, you receive IC and RC reciprocity throughout the state. Now, a person can put out a, I can say I, I'm certified because I took the CCAR uh, course, but I'm not certified. I have received a certification from, from CCAR as having taken the course. All it means is I completed the course. There's no grading in the course. If you sit there for the five days and the 40 hours and, and, and listen, that's primarily all you got to do. At the end, they're going to give you a certificate. Well, that doesn't mean that you, you really know the information or you're really able to translate the information into help for anybody else, including yourself. Yeah, but so I'm, that's a good point to, to bring up because uh, I want to make it very clear that this is just the acknowledgement that the minimum um, of expectations have been met. And we're going to have a whole show about what to expect in a recovery coach because since the... Um, certifications and the, um, uh, you know, everyone's hanging out a shingle, it seems nowadays, or, or very limited, true understanding of even um, 
what what they're expected to do or within what parameters. Uh, you know, I see a lot of uh, uh, misnomers and and ignorance and sometimes even arrogance. You know, people take a weekend course and they hang out their shingle and um, just talking with them, I, it scares. It just scares the crap out of me that they would actually say they're a, a recovery coach because they really are clueless. So, but that's a whole story um, worth a whole show. So we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, it, there's just so much to talk about with you as always. Um, you know, so it, it's like I want to get everything in. But for you, and I even said this to you, um, you seem much more advanced than a five. Day forty-hour course, and it's because you are. <laughs> well, actually, I I am in the sense that I have had a lot of experiences throughout my dysfunctional uh, history as as far as being able to help myself in my addictive disorders. I've been able to help a lot of other people in another a lot of other capacities. I've worked as a transitional case manager, for example, in Orlando, Florida, for a time. Uh, working with people who have HIV and AIDS, and that introduced me to the case management construct, as well as billing and, and, and gathering units of time, as well as education. Though, so that aspect of of serving in a peer-like capacity, uh, I was exposed to. Uh, additionally, you know, my legal background doesn't doesn't hurt in terms of being able to research and apply research, uh, draft and create documents, including uh, tools. Uh, that may be used for analysis or quantitative or qualitative analysis by uh, entities such as insurance companies and 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 the the CMS Medicaid Medicare uh, who want to look at the numbers and and see the quality of services. So those those aspects of my background did inform uh, how I approach recovery coaching and uh, analytically. And I knew that through the process of me creating for myself a help list, these, these rituals that became books for me uh, that I ultimately published, I created another cognitive behavioral therapeutic program accidentally. But in the process of doing that, uh, I came to the attention somehow of uh, Dr. Uh, Sudhakar Yakanati at Omix Group, uh, who heads up a group of international scientists on the subject of addiction and uh, addiction research and therapy. Uh, who invited me ultimately to come to Vegas in 2013 to moderate uh, that particular conference of scientists as well as to keynote address them about the uh, emotional disposition therapy that I had created, self-directed wellness driven, which is how I work, self-directed wellness driven uh, mentoring, which is what the Fed, uh, the federal government is looking for in terms of peer advocates or recovery coaches. This is a qualification for being able to get paid for providing a service. Uh, what they found, what science has proven is that people who are self-directed and wellness driven are more likely to, to maintain a life in recovery, but not so much in recovery, but in wellness, working through seven dimensions of wellness and five stages of change to continually improve the quality of their life, not just from uh, stopping drug use, but increasing uh, health care for themselves, preventative health care, exercising, quitting smoking, um, you know, creating their own ideal environment. And what the Fed has done, what the federal government has done, is indicated that their individual recovery plans have to now be included in their overall plan uh, for treatment inside these, these institutions, which is what is making the outpatient and inpatient clinics have to consider bringing in recovery coaches. But the, the way the states are doing it is, we have to be, make sure that they have certain qualifications. And those qualifications have to be experiential in terms of being able to help other peers. They have to be able to prove that they've done, in New York State, I think it's uh, 500 hours of peer-to-peer -peer service provision. They've had at least, I think, uh, 25 to 50 hours of direct uh, supervision in that capacity. Uh, to ensure that they understand how how that works. Um, they additionally, again, in New York and Connecticut, have to have that core uh, CCAR curriculum under their belt. They have to do some additional educational studies, including 15 hours of ethics training, so that they understand the boundaries, though different from uh, being a drug counselor who can't leave uh, the office, let's say, and go visit with uh, the, the client at home or go out with the client. 
uh, certified recovery peer advocate, which is New York State's name for the certified recovery coaches who can receive Medicaid reimbursement, is expected to do that. They're expected to do what's called warm handoffs. Go with that person from treatment to wherever they need follow-up and uh, help them create a recovery capital, a community of support where they live. Because for too, far too long, they've been released back into the environment that created the situation that caused them to go in. So we have to be able to help them maneuver that environment uh, with the same triggers, the same thing, but from a different perspective. And that means empowering them uh, with recovery plans and walking with them and helping them build a network of support so they'll be able to get through it. And that's how uh, being able to document that becomes very essential uh, and, the, and, the, and one of the keys in being able to be reimbursed. Uh, it's similar to being a, a sponsor uh, in an NA or AA program in the sense that the boundaries are broader but not as broad. It's mm -hmm. similar to being a drug counselor in that you do have to document the assistance that you're providing and how you're providing it. However, you're a non-clinician. So you're not diagnosing, you're not advising at any point. Um, you're helping people do a, a journey in self-discovery. So yeah, it's a, it's a very special skill set that extends beyond just this, I've got a recovery coaching certificate, which is why states are uh, now uh, certifying, uh, and they're not using the term recovery coach in their certification process. So people don't get confused with, okay, well, this is a recovery coach, but they're not state certified. So the states don't license, no state license recovery coaches, but there are several states that do certify recovery coaches. And if they have state certification, that means they've met some educational and experiential requirements and translated it in a testing situation where the state says, okay, they have the requisite ability and knowledge to be able to do the job. Okay, yeah, it, it, you know, I've been doing this for about, I'd say, three and a half to four years, and it still confuses me because every, you know, there's so many people that um, call it peer-to-peer -peer or um, some people completely um, see them as two different entities. Some people see some overlap. Some people think that it's, uh, you know, one and the same. So it just really depends on your background and your training and um, your certification and your experience and your exposure and your state. So um, I, I still have to admit um, that I do um, need information, uh, and especially I, I don't live in New York. I'm in California, so I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. But I think what you're doing is really going to set the stage as far as the, um, like you said, what are the uh, prerequisites that you need to be able to say you're um, certified in in as a recovery coach or as a as a peer. Um, supporter, whatever, you know, what, whatever the names of them are. And you, since you are working with, um, and you were trained with CCAR, um, and you're the, you're the pilot, you are the first one who designed the, um, the means to have non-clinical soap notes, which when I was like, what is that? And, and that's how you're able to um, be begin this process. So for those people, because um, they don't teach soap notes really, because that is more of a, um, a clinical side for therapists or um, psychiatrists, but you've found a way to um, bridge that gap and, and have them available, and you, you do workshops on that. So recovery coaches that have the, the right credentials can learn how to do non-clinical soap notes and get reimbursed. But this is all in its absolute infancy, um, so I don't want people to bombard you with phone calls and emails. How do I do this? So just tell us what soap notes are and how did you, because um, you didn't reinvent the wheel, but you made them non-clinical. So just explain the difference with that. Okay. Clinical soap notes uh, are used by medical practitioners as well as, as you've indicated, therapists and, and uh, psychiatrists and even drug counselors are, uh, case acts or substance abuse counselors are required to create soap notes or DAP notes, which is a different way of notation. But at the end of the day, the soap notes is subjective, objective, assessment, 
and plan for each client or each person that's served. So the subjective is what they're telling you. The objective is what you observe of them. The assessment is how you put the two together. Your, your, your professional opinion of what's going on. And then the plan is what you guys have agreed, the, the, the counselor and the client has agreed to do. That's in a clinical setting. Now that can also be the, in the doctor's office. If I go to the doctor and I say, I've got a sore thumb, and the doctor say, well, I'm looking at the thumb and the thumb looks fine. So you've got subjective, I've got a sore thumb. You've got objective, it looks fine. You've got an assessment that I touched it and the doctor then does his clinical aspect of it. And then the plan is, okay, well, we're gonna go get an x-ray. So that's how a soap note works. How do you do that when you're working with peer-to-peer, non-clinical? I'm not allowed to do that kind of analysis or advising. So subjective is, of course, what you say. What do you want from me? Why are you here? Well, I'm, I, I'm on drugs and I want to get off. Okay. And then we look at the objective aspect of that. What do they look like to me? What are they presenting to me? In, in terms of our soap notation, I can, I can write down what I see, but I'm looking at everything through the prism of the tools that I got through the CCAR training. And that's my, that's my uh, cheat, if you will, to create this non-clinical soap notes. Because remember, these tools were created by <laughs> clinicians. So, so the tools are clinical, even though, uh, even though I'm not a clinician, I can use the tools for myself and my job is to help the peer learn how to to use the tool for themselves. So we still look at the subjective aspect of what they're saying. When we go to the objective aspect, we pull out a tool and we start talking about uh, for them what what their perceptions are uh, objectively of what they look like. So they can come in subjectively and say, well, I'm on drugs and I want to get off. Well, what's an objective thing, what's an objective way to look at that? And and you say to them, okay, what do you see when you see you today, right now? Well, my clothes are disheveled or uh, or, or I've got a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. And so we help them become their own coach, but we give them the tools and show them how to use the tools. Well, as a clinician, as a non-clinician, I'm documenting this. The person has come in and this is what they said and and I show them this tool and this is what they said and then at the assessment stage it's just reviewing the seven dimensions of wellness which is what we were talking about that's what you learn in the workshop seven dimensions of wellness CCAR teaches that you have an assessment you do the assessment of, of where you are on those scales in those seven areas of your life emotional educational physical health psychological health spiritual life occupational life um, uh, societally you deal with those seven areas through five stages of, uh, of, of uh, the five stages of change pre-contemplation contemplation um, preparation action and maintenance so they they'll come to the conclusion as to where they are the idea is to use the tools and and introduce them to those tools and help them filter through those tools what they're saying and what they're feeling and then they ultimately come up with their own plan which you document so all you're doing is documenting their interaction with the tools that you're introducing at the various stages of the of the note taking of the interaction subjective objective uh, assessment and plan and what I do is help put that in a way in a system that any any coach could use because the coaches are familiar with the tools they just haven't used them in these ways to create non clinical so notes and the notes will with each weekly contingency management plan at the end of the day what the insurance companies want to know what the state wants to know is are they getting better? And so we break down, they do a recovery plan, an overall plan, and then they do a weekly contingency management plan. How do we get all the way over there from all the way over here? One step at a time. So we create a task at a time. And when I say we, they decide the task. My job is to utilize motivational interviewing, which is a clinical skill, a clinical tool, 
and you have to take courses on this before you get certified by the state. And very brief courses, mind you. I'm not talking about uh, uh, months or years, just, just hours. We're talking about hours uh, to acquire the basic rudimentary skills. Now, any skill like that gets better with time. <laughs> you know, you get better at answer, asking open-ended questions and leading people to, to deeper thoughts of what their answers may be or what their solutions may be. If somebody says, well, I need money. Okay, well, uh, what do you think the answer to that? How can you get money? Well, I, I could get a job. Okay, well, what kind of work can you do? Well, I could, and those are motivational interviewing type questions where you're opening it up so the person begins to think in possibility terms and you record that. That's what, they're, that's what the state, what Medicaid, what the payers are looking for, that information. And while that's happening, you're also providing an additional service. When those people go home, your job is to accompany them. If they're, if they're you know, broken up from the family, if those relationships can be restored, you help them do that by communicating yourself as, as their advocate, communicating yourself with their family members to see if you can get their family members to create an, a support for them as you try to help them, you know, regain control of their life and increase the quality of their life. So, so I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's what, when Optum Health came out and did my site audit, that's what's most important, being able to document all of this stuff. And none of the courses, to my knowledge, actually teach how to document in such a way as you can be reimbursed by Medicaid or Medicare. And, and so I use the tools that, that I got from CCAR. I use those tools to create a method of documentation that Medicaid and uh, the insurance companies say will fit the bill. Okay, so you have created this wonderful opportunity because it's, it's, it's not only for recovery coaches to get paid, but it's also to make them uh, their services more available in, in different arenas and even working for themselves. So reco most recovery coaches do work independently, but this opens the doors and the avenues really for um, recovery coaches in your state, New York or, or Connecticut, um, to be able to um, have agencies, organizations, treatment centers, nonprofits uh, interested in bringing, bringing on board a recovery coach. Or um, you know, or two or three. It depends on how big they are. So this is really, uh, this is really incredible news because from what you're doing, it's it's opening the doors, but in in so many ways. I mean, it's going to be quite a ripple effect. Yeah, that that's our hope certainly because uh, coming out of a, an addictive disorder and, and having known a great many people who uh, who have come out, uh, unfortunately there are only about fifty of us at my last count in New York State who have the certification certified recovery care advocates, which the the, the criteria is not it's not prohibitive, it's just um, time consuming to one degree. It's it's less than a thousand dollars to get through the whole process. And, and that's from, state, from, from day one, from education, CCAR training, uh, through. It's, it's, it's less than a thousand bucks to get the certification. Once you have the certification, then you're eligible to uh, be reimbursed for Medicaid. But now the piece, as you've indicated, that's missing is the documentation. You have to be able to do this documentation. You have to be able to, and everybody in, in treatment that gets paid by Medicaid or Medicare know what a form 1500, the claim 1500 form is. You've got to be able to complete that form and you have to be able to have soap notes to back up service delivery. So if you don't know how to make your non-clinical soap notes, you can't get paid. And that's one of the things that have kept us out of, uh, out of the treatment continuum. So yeah, we're, we're very positive that not only in New York State, but as the movement is happening and the recovery coaches are being trained and they're getting the core educational curriculum, because the, uh, the same criteria that's here in New York is also in Florida as well as Connecticut. And through uh, certification, New York State certification, you also get uh, ICNRC certification, which is reciprocity, which means if you're certified in New York State, if you're a certified recovery career advocate certified by New York State, there are other states and even other countries 
who will acknowledge that certification and that will qualify you again uh, to receive uh, the insurance payments because that's the direction Medicaid and Medicare are going in for at least the next two years that President Obama is in office if they don't repeal the Parity Act. I'm so, so scared of that. I'm really scared that's going to happen as soon as he drives away. So that's why it's important to get in and prove our metal, because the theory is we can reduce crisis health care costs, which are high. We can reduce rates of recidivism in treatment if we as recovery coaches, as certified recovery career advocates, are on the ground with the people in their communities showing them or showing them where the resources are, how to help themselves, and standing there as their backup. Because many of them are in these standalone situations. Many of them are, are withering on the vine because they don't have any kind of recovery capital that they acknowledge. If you've got a place to live, that's a piece of recovery capital. If you've got a car, transportation, or access to, that's recovery. Those are things that can be leveraged to get you to the life that you ideally want. But somebody's got to be able to help you understand how to get there. That's what the recovery coach is ultimately responsible to do and not to so, so much tell you, okay, well, do it the NA way or the AA way. Let help you find the way that works best for you that will increase your quality of life, including medication-assisted treatment. If methadone maintenance, a methadone, methadone maintenance program will work for you or Vivitrol or any medication or medicated-assisted treatment will work for you, I'm all for that if it's going to increase your quality of life. I met a man named Walter Ginter who started the um, medication-assisted recovery program maybe in 2008 or so and the federal government has replicated his program in 13 states. Wow. Walter makes no, no, no bones about letting people know he's on methadone and has been on methadone for years. He's an executive. He flies all over the country doing work. He does work at the Einstein Center in the Bronx here in New York, has been doing it for years. And if he didn't tell you he was on methadone, you wouldn't know. The man, I mean, he has a nice home, a nice, you know, he lives a wonderful life, and, and he's not one of those people, you know, standing on the street corner nodding, you know, because he's an addict. Come on. So, I mean, we've got to open up our understanding that there are many pathways to increasing the quality of our lives, and that aspect of recovery coaching, that core training, and, and at the end of the day, what we're talking about when we talk about these recovery coaching schools and all of that, when we talk about being able to get paid for the service, You've got to have a pan recovery mentality, and you've got to be able to document the services that you provide in such a way as they will substantiate that you're actually helping people stay out of hospitals, stay out of treatment centers, and control or increase the quality of their lives. Well, I have to tell you, I'm glad you're the guinea pig and not me. <laughs> But I give you I give you some so much props that you're doing this because it's really it's not only benefiting uh, New York, Connecticut, but it's really going to be the model that um, all of this starts to come across. You know, all of this, all of the states, and it's uh, you know I'm really excited to see where it goes. So I will of course stay in stay in uh, touch with this, and I I pay attention to all the all the media about it and social media outlets and uh, I mean these are these are things that we're talking about all the time or I hear when people call me or email me individually they're like I'm not making you know they're, they're so panicked they don't know not only what they're doing but they don't know how to market or how to um, get paid and there's a lot of uh, confusion in, on their part you know what what are they really doing and um, by being um, overseen to um, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, through through documentation. I think it not only protects the recovery coach, uh, reimburses the recovery coach, our peer support, uh, but it shows accountability for the recovery coach. So we, we we need to streamline these, you know, what it means to be a recovery coach, and that will be, I think, our next show. We'll we'll uh, delve into that. So if you have any questions for this wonderful person, um, you can contact him. I will put his email address and his his website's right on there. It's my um, what does it say? I can't see it. My recovery. My recoverycoach.biz. 
Right, myrecoverycoach.biz. And um, if you have general questions, you don't need to email us individually, um, but we can uh, look at all of the questions you have and we will try to uh, see what are some current thoughts or concerns and we can address some of those on the next episode. Um, Recovery Coaching with Lucius Conway. So thank you so much and uh, we really appreciate all that you're doing and you're really providing a, a really strong example and um, I really just admire what you're doing because I'm always worried about um, just the vagueness in the direction of recovery coaches and, and what does that truly mean. So you've really helped me uh, clarify a lot of things and to know what's going on and, and you started it so I just think that's awesome. Well, thank you, Shira, for having me. I look forward to the rest of the series and answering any questions anybody may have and encouraging the recovery coaches that are out there or the people that have a desire to become recovery coaches to not give up hope because you're on a road that will lead ultimately to you being able to uh, help others and be remunerated for your services as is right. Right. So uh, what, is, what is, you can just uh, tell people your email, but I will put it under in the comments. So if they want to contact you, what is your email? Uh, you can contact me at Lucius Conway at myrecoverycoach.biz or Lucius in New York at gmail.com. Oh yeah, that's that's great. And make sure you, you know you check out his website. We haven't touched on it, but he is a most awesome jazz singer and tucks and, and tails and everything. So check out some of his videos on YouTube. He's he's not all about recovery coaching. He has a well and a balanced life. So <laughs> well, there's an article on the website that's entitled uh, "Role Modeling Recovery," and that's one of the most important things about being a recovery coach is that our lives, our journey should constantly be about continual wellness. Recovery some, somehow uh, it pitches everything backwards. You know, I'm, I'm recovering from as opposed to I'm living a well life. I'm, I'm about wellness and, and being well and making my dreams come true. I, I don't think that there's anything impossible for anyone to achieve. And as a, as a recovery coach, as a certified recovery career advocate, that's my objective. That's how I start all my sessions. What does your ideal life look like? Let's see. Let's, let's make that happen. Right on. You're awesome. So until next time, keep those uh, emails or questions that you have, and we'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can on the next uh, episode with Lucius Conway, Recovery Coach. Thanks.